It's been a full week. Um, a lot of different things have been going on. Fantastic things, wonderful things. Uh, and it also involved me getting lost in my sermon preparation. I'll warn you now, I have more notes than I've ever had in 16 years of ministry. You know, in part because I messed up some number of weeks ago. You guys remember some number of weeks ago I told you that I was going to, you know, we're going to start this sermon, that it might be possibly it was going to be a two-part sermon, and then a little bit later I said, okay, I, I feel it's not a two-part sermon, it's a three-part sermon, and then we got into the three-part sermon, it was supposed to be part three today, but as I was preparing, I realized that part three actually has three subset parts to go along with the nine-part something. Yeah, we're getting lost, aren't we, peeps? Long story short, it's been an incredible journey, has it not? Have you enjoyed our time together in the book of Mark? You feel like you've kind of been going along in the story and growing to know Jesus. And I think that that's what's happened here for me. When I said a two-part, I did it. I thought it was kind of a two-part presentation. And now all of a sudden I start to see everything that we looked at last week and, and, and how it fits in and why it's so profound, and why it's so incredibly important and what God might want to do with this, even and yet through our lives yet today. And so as we have this open, I'll be a little bit of a review today, but in the time that we have left, let's pray. God would find us and share with us what he wants. Would you please join me in prayer? Great God of heaven, I do thank you so very much for who you are and how you work and what you've done for us in your son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, for the determination that belongs to you to be about a work that we might know you and that we might grow, that we might, yes, yeah, certainly be saved, but that, Lord, we might live that salvation out until we see you face to face. And so I ask for your blessing upon this group of people. That you would lead and guide our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit's power, directing us to where it is that you know we need to go. Challenging us and convicting in us the things that need to change and providing with encouragement, the courage that is needed for us to put it into action in our lives. Certainly, Lord, for our own blessing, but more so for the glory of Jesus. That others might come to know him. That your name might be exalted. That you indeed might be magnified. So be about that work here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, look with me at Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, like I said, it's a little bit of a review. But for those of you who weren't with this or didn't watch online, right, I want to share with you that what I've been proposing for a number of weeks is that the piece of scripture that I'm about to read in this next verse is the pivotal mark or pivotal piece of scripture in the whole book of Mark. That's how important this verse is. When we get to Mark chapter 8, verse 31, everything changes because it is the first of three declarations that Jesus will make for the very purpose intent in which he came. This is the focal point. This is, is declared of him saying, Behold, the, Kevin, uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. This message is profoundly beautiful and is profoundly important to the change that must take place in his disciples and in us moving forward. As we prepare our hearts and minds for just you know, four short weeks away, Easter. May God find us faithful to grow and to be stretched, challenged in our understanding of who He is and what He's done for us in His Son. Look with me at verse 31. And He, that being Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes, uh, excuse me, uh, by the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now that's a bit of a review. We talked about that last week. But what we didn't spend, I, I don't think we spent enough time talking about, is Jesus saying to, him, to his disciples, I am the Son of Man. 
He said to them, he said, he said, hey, who do everybody think I say I am? And all of a sudden this, some that, some this and that. He said, but who do you say that I am? And as profound as that question is anyway, right, to each and every one of us, the disciple Peter answered correctly, he says, we have come to believe that you are the Christ. You are the promised Holy One of God. That's true. And Jesus says, the Son of God. Man must suffer, be rejected, and killed. Now that title, Son of Man, is important. We're going to read about it again in a little bit. And it's important to understand because of the day and age and world we live in. In a number of different conversations, a number of different places, maybe some of you have heard it too, right? Has anyone ever heard anyone say, right, in the midst of this or that or that, it's generally involves screwing up, messing up, right? And someone says, oh, give me a break. I'm only human. <clears throat> right? Anybody ever said that? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at some place or point in time, we're kind of like, we're only human. And there's a major problem with that statement. Because when Jesus says that he is the son of man, we are recognizing that Jesus is fully human. He is fully God, and he is fully man. The last two big, I don't know, I'm sure, how do you wrap your head around that? <laughs> oh, yes. And this is Jesus. Subpart number four, part three, another time, another place. But the, the character, the existence, the personhood of Christ is important. He is fully God, and he is fully man. And when we talk, when he says the, the son of man, that's showing it that he is, by example, right, our lead, firstborn, among all things. He lived the perfect life, sinless, perfect life, fully human. He did that for a number of different reasons, subpart number five. But at least for us here today, he did that as an example of what obedience and of trust and of faith look like. So when we say, hey, I'm only human, we are kicking to the curb God's command for us to be like Christ. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And I'm not talking about holier than now, Bible thumping wackos. <laughs> I'm simply talking about our trust and obedience to the will of God without excuse to allow Him to stretch us and to grow us. Why don't we grow? Sometimes we don't grow because we immediately put out an excuse that says, I'm only human. But God wants to show us something else. Wants to do something else. We've been talking for some time about three questions. To which today I'm going to add a fourth. The three questions have been, what is it that Jesus wants to show us, to teach us, right? And in this case, what he said, right, what he said to his disciples earlier in Mark chapter 8, he says, do you still not yet understand? We've come to the, the place, the point where the answer to the question, what does Jesus want to teach us? Peter rightfully answers, he says, you are the Christ. Jesus says to him, he said, well done, Simon Barjona, blessed are you, right? You did well, that's it. But now, what needs to change in us? In light of this understanding. And we have said over time, if you permit me just kind of a broad stroke of review, we've said that what needs to change over time is, is us. Our hearts, hearts and minds need to be transformed in order for us to go beyond just a mere acknowledgement of the wisdom of God to the practice and application of the wisdom of God in our lives. And so we need to change. 
We said that that's why these miracles are being performed the way that they are. This is the reason why, you know, Jesus is called the importance of repentance. This is why he's gone through it. We've talked about their ability to see correctly, their ability to hear correctly. Whatever it is that needs to change in us, Jesus is patiently and kindly working through all of these things so that we might grow in our understanding that he is the Christ and that he is about a work and has a plan that may, just may be, different than ours. Those two questions bring us to the third question, which is, then what will it cost me? What will it cost me? Look with me at what Jesus said in verse 34. In verse 34, and calling the crowd to him. Hey, this is kind of interesting. So let's not... Uh, Let's not dismiss this. Sometimes we look at, uh, look at Jesus and his disciples. We look at Jesus and the religious leaders. We look at Jesus and the crowd. And what we're about to read here, you know, you could possibly uh, break it apart in your head like you did when you were a kid and you got the little miniature versions of stories. Okay? Sometimes we don't grow because we've created excuses. And sometimes we don't grow because we don't or aren't convinced or not willing to listen that Jesus is actually talking to us. It's like, oh, he means that for somebody else. That's for, that's for pastors. Okay? What Jesus has done is he's worked through all of these different things. And as he has rebuked Peter, as he's gone through all of us, right? Or excuse me, as he began to teach, and as Peter rebuked him, Jesus now seeing all of these things, he brings the disciples and the crowd. That's all of us. Brings the disciples and he brings the crowd. What's about to come out of him is for everyone. And so what he says uh, in verse 34, And calling the crowd to him with the disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him... Will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels? And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. What does Jesus want to teach? What has to change? And what will it cost me? The answer to the question of cost Is it's going to cost us our will, our desire, our want, the core of our very lives. And to what effect? Glory. The glory of Jesus Christ. What he's done. Who he is. An alignment of our lives with his. That takes me back then to this problem of why. I mean, everybody would agree. Hey, you all agree? You want Jesus to be glorified? Yes. In your whole life, in everyday ways? Yes. Is it happening? Yeah. <laughs> On my good days, we need to grow. What inhibits us from growth? And it is the stark contrast between who Jesus is and who we are and our interactions even after he's introduced to us that he is the Christ. You see, I find that contrast in verse 31 where it says, And Jesus began to teach them plainly. Contrast to Peter in verse 8, and, and Peter took him aside, and Peter began to rebuke. Jesus began to teach, Peter began to rebuke. We'll come back to that. Because I think one of the words that we jumped over real quick, real fast, last week that we shouldn't have, is recorded for us in verse 31. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must 
Must. Hey, are you taking notes? Are you one of those people that underlines things in your Bible? Underline the word must. Right? You're one of those people who say, if I mark up my Bible, I'm going to get hit by a lightning bolt? That's not true. <laughs> my Bible's full of pencil marks all over. The word must is absolutely imperative. The Son of Man must. The word must brings about the necessity, the great need. It, it just, it, 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 it is imperative that these things happen. And it is imperative that the Son of Man, the Christ, Jesus, must suffer, must be rejected, and must die. As much as Christ, excuse me, that's not the way, right way to say it. Because I've already, we've already identified, we already agree, we know what Scripture teaches is true, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Because he came to live an example, because he came to live our life, he came to stand in our place. He came to stand in our place to suffer our death, to suffer our penalty, to stand in the place of his people and do what no other person could do. And that is to satisfy the wrath of God in Cancel sin's curse. Destroying sin and replacing death with life. And Jesus said that must happen. Why? I don't know why. If we're going to grow, we need to come to grips with another thing. Sometimes we approach the things of Christ and the answer to the, why must Jesus suffer, be rejected, and die? Well, to save me, of course. Real. Isn't that a bit, is the word impetuous? I don't know, somebody, but don't Google it. Is, it. is it a little high on our end to say that the very reason that the Christ, the Holy One of God, should suffer and be rejected and be killed is for me. Now ultimately I think we we find that because he suffered and rejected and was killed that he does something that allows us to be saved and fellowship with him. And that we are the benefactor of those things, was it the sole motive for us? And I challenge that thought because this gets to the to the part where we start thinking about ourselves so much in fact that we begin to go down the road with Peter fighting against the very word must and the will of God. You see, what we know too, and we get the benefit of, right, is we get the whole picture. We get the whole picture. We get Colossians chapter 1. For, right, he is, that means Jesus, for he is the image of the invisible God. And by him and through him and for him, all things were created. That means that everything that we read about in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, that's Jesus. He's making He's forming. When you see him walking in the cool of the garden of the day, that's Jesus. And he willed and purposed that there would be a creation and that men and women would be in it and that he would have a relationship with them. And he intends to set that relationship back. And he must. What we deserve is something entirely different. We don't deserve what he's done for us. 
That's grace. That's mercy. And yet at times, right? On our good days, we understand that. On our bad days, eh, we fumble and fight and farce a little bit. Jesus began to teach, and Peter began to rebuke. That word rebuke is the same word that Jesus used when he rebuked the demons. Remember the demons were early in chapter Mark? And they said, what do you have to do with us? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked them. He condemned and, and made sight of the demons of hell. And now that same word is Peter rebuking Jesus. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Time out. Sermon part three, sub part six. A little special time, John. This is what I'm about to share with you isn't biblical. Okay? It's just how my brain works. And it goes back to us having this full revelation. We have a full revelation because we saw the full story. It's been shared with us time and time again. But these guys, have we not? Can we confess that we've given the disciples a hard time long enough? Yeah. They didn't have it all together. They didn't realize that. I mean, they didn't have the you know, spirit of time. But at any place and point in time, they did. After the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus and Pentecost and the spirit. I mean, they, they're kind of like, oh, I get it. And it all kind of comes back to them. And so go with me, if you will, right? Early, early church in Jerusalem. The disciples doing everything that Jesus trained them to. Church is growing. Things are fantastic. Bunch of guys sitting around the circle, right? Peter, James, John, you know, Bartholomew, Matthew, they're all sitting around. Hey, 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 hey. you remember? <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember. Remember? Remember when? I don't know. What? What? Who in the world thought we should poke Jesus in the front of the boat and wake him up? Then I don't know what we were thinking. But do you remember when he stood up and told the sea to be still? Yeah, I about wet myself. That was awesome. Ah. <laughs> You know, all this stuff. Maybe they're sitting around having a conversation one day. And one of them said, Hey, you remember? Remember the very first time he told us everything would happen? Yeah. He had to tell us two more times, but I remember the first time. You know why I remember the first time? Why is that? Because I remember that was that was right after Peter made a declaration of Jesus was the Christ. And then somebody snickers from the back. Oh yeah, right after he made that crazy. And then he got all big and he thought, may it never be. And he began to rebuke Jesus. Peter, what were you thinking? And at that point, Peter's like, I was just thinking what y'all were thinking. See, when he said, when, when Jesus said, who do you say I am? Remember what we looked at in Matthew? They looked at Matthew. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I think in that moment, in this moment, right, Peter's still getting a little bit of the leftovers of that. Because what happened in Peter, what happened in Peter was when he heard Jesus say, The Son of Man must be rejected, must suffer, must be killed. Peter knew that if the man that they were following, the Son of Man, who was there to be their leader, who was there to be their teacher, who was there to be their example, who was there to go first in all things in front of them, that if he must suffer, we must suffer, we must be rejected, we must die. To which Peter said, no way! So back to our little conversation, right? Peter, why did you say what you did? Hey, so I was thinking what you were all thinking. None of us wanted to suffer. And none of us wanted to be rejected. Certainly none of us wanted to die. And yet, back to Isaiah chapter 53. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. 
interesting. If we dismiss the fact, right, and say, you know, it's like, wow, <laughs> oh, him making light of Jesus fully meant. The other thing people do is they make light of his suffering and his rejection and his death because they say, wow, he's God. I mean, he's God. I mean, if he's God, how could he have suffered like I suffered? If he's, I mean, he didn't run. I mean, he died, but he didn't. He didn't really die because he's God. And, I mean, he lives to be raised from the dead. And we try to take the wisdom of God and process it through, our, you know, I don't care how big your head it is, right? Process it through our, our cranial synapses, pushing all of this profound wisdom into, into little boxes where we can make it all make sense. But really what we're, we're doing is we're fighting against the wisdom of God. And we're using excuses. And we're using the way we think things should go to explain the difference between what he's done and how we think it should go. And we don't understand the scriptures true. <coughs> Out of the anguish of his soul. The Son of Man must suffer. That is to say that the Son of Man must to the depth of his soul suffer the anguish and the pain the death should be ours in order that something else happen. Now, when we rebel against these things, when we rebel against these things, when we rebuke Jesus Christ in our own lives, I don't want that to be confused with our questioning and our doubts and our fears and our feelings. We are permitted to have questions. We are permitted to doubt. We are permitted to have fear. We are permitted to fail. Matter of fact, when I get a phone call that says, oh, I failed, I say, congratulations, you're growing. Because if I never attempt to be stretched through Jesus, I may never stumble, fall, and get back up and say, Lord, thank you. May I have another? Of course there's going to be times when we're being stretched by faith that we're going to be fearful. We're putting one faith, foot in front of another in areas that we've never walked before in our lives. If you're not afraid because you're encountering things that drive you to a new level of trust in Jesus Christ, there's something else wrong. Doubt? You're going to have some doubts? And we're going to have some doubts at time. Because that is the mission that we are exchanging our self-governed wisdom that we're so sure about for the wisdom of God that is profoundly different than what we know. Questions? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, as we've been studying the book of Mark, don't you know? Questions are how we learn. Jesus wants us to have questions. But have you ever stopped to think about ourselves that the reason why we may not be growing the way we want is because one, we've created excuses, one, we've created self lives but the other is that we're just flat out rebuking Jesus in our lives at different places, points in time. Because we didn't like, or because Jesus didn't do what we thought he should do. Because he didn't see the world the way we think he should see the world. As we've been going through the exercises of Mark, we look at things like Jesus casting out demons. And we wonder why, if Jesus is really Jesus, why he had just cancel out the, the, that he would silence the voices that drive us crazy sometimes in our own lives. As he healed Peter's mother-in-law, we ask and wonder, if, you know, why wouldn't he heal our loved ones? As we watch him make the paralytic walk, we wonder why so many people are still crippled by fear, dementia, and other addictions. As we go through, we see him calm the sea. We wonder why he won't calm the storms in our own lives when we see this constant storming all around us. And these are profound questions. These are big questions. These are impactful questions that sadly will drive many away from Jesus. 
and away from the church because they're not really asking about Jesus. They're just wondering why he hasn't done what they want. What Christ purchased for us. When it says the Son of Man must what Christ purchased for us was our lives unto everlasting. The great blessing that he has given us is he has given us life everlasting. Yet we expect at times more good things like selfish wanting children. In fact, all of any of our existence, any part of our existence where we experience any level of what God calls good is not our right, but is called one thing. See, Peter rebuked Jesus We've talked about this before because even though he said he is the Messiah, Peter had been trained and equipped, taught by a number of different people that the Messiah would come as a king and kick out Rome. That he was going to come and that the Messiah would be a shepherd. It would be loving and kind to take care of people, but still he would be an earthly prince. And earthly princes don't live and rule long if they're being rejected, suffering, and killed. Jesus, out of the anguish of his soul, is asking them to trust his wisdom, which would make them righteous, not temporarily satisfied. He sees something far greater than they can see. He knows, that being Jesus, that the very reason why he was set was to reset the creation that he made and the fellowship that he had with men and women. To get rid of sin once for all so that that might be made good. Like he said, called and intended before we messed it up. We expect more. We want good. And in all of our existence, any good that we experience is called one thing. And it is called grace. Grace. See, another time, another place, subpart number seven. We'll go through to look at all of those parts as we review. But I was thinking this week. If God takes me home tomorrow, and this is the last sermon I have ever preached, I will be profoundly happy. Not because of how I've done. You guys can critique that later. And you will. But because this piece of scripture so beautifully demonstrates the character of God. And it is, as we've been saying, so very pivotal to the transformation of our lives. That if the last message I have for you comes from this text to see the heart of Jesus correctly. That when he says he must, that it comes from the anguish of his soul to endure all these things so that you and I might be granted life everlasting. But that what's more, he didn't save us just for us, but that he might be glorified on heaven, in heaven and on earth. And 
that people might come to know Him. But what needs to happen is our transformation. And that He's by example shown a way. If we would exchange our wisdom for His wisdom. Subpart 12. What, what subpart am I on? <laughs> Doesn't matter. What must change in our lives is what Peter fought against. Jesus said the Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, and die. Jesus addressed those things and said, you want to prove that you're my follower? Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. So prove to follow. I think we could spend two sermons on each of those. If ever in the day and age that we live in, something more appropriate would be an entire sermon talked about why we have the inability to deny ourselves. Ourselves in charge. The lordship issues of ourselves. Our justification, our wisdom, our one, our desire. Our, our, our. Jesus says to deny ourselves. Our, de our inability to deny ourselves brings to a, an incredible warning. That if we're ashamed of Him, He'll be ashamed of us. We need to look more at that and what that means and why. A simple accountability question will do for today. How many people do you know? Well, excuse me. One. How many people do you know that don't know Jesus? And of those people, how many of those people know that you're a Christian? That you're a follower of Jesus? I'm not talking about being the workplace evangelist, right? Running up and down the hall, running up and down the cubicle saying, Turn the barn! Turn the barn! Turn the if that happens, you should get fired. <laughs> I'm just talking about, you know, when it comes to where we've put our faith and trust, are we willing to let people know that unashamedly? Are we still worried about being rejected? A lot of times people say, oh, pick up your cross, follow him. You know what that means? Cross meant death. Meant death. We got to pick up our cross and follow. We got to die to self every day. Well, subpart 16, another time, but you know what that meant? You know, pick up your cross. Right? And don't think that the disciples didn't know what that meant. They lived there with Roman occupation. Everybody knew that the cross was a Roman device for death. The Romans make you carry that crossbeam from your place of, of judgment to your place of death. And when you carried that cross, you were marked. You were, you were, you were outcast from the town. You, you were, you were judged by others. Dare I say, they would reject you. I think we'd all love to say, oh, I died today and live for Jesus. Oh, that's good. But where are you ashamed of His wisdom because it doesn't match the wisdom of the world? Where are you ashamed of His character revealed because it's not where you think it should be? Where would you deny Him an opportunity to work because you're too embarrassed? There's lots of reasons why we don't grow. There's lots of things that need to change in us. And if we're honest, the thing that's really hard is what it's going to cost us is our lives. And our willingness, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of rejection, even in the midst of death, to realize that Jesus, the Son of Man, the Christ, our Savior, he has done something far greater than we can ever ask or imagine. He's included us in His family. And because of that, we live forever. I have more to say, but I am way out of time. Bring your team up.
Bring your team up, hurry, run, 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 <laughs> run. No falling over. I have one more thing I want to say, so I'll come back after we close this song to torture you one more time. Before we have like four weeks till Easter. And I don't know how long we've been in the book of Mark. Right? Sometime in October. So October we started the book of Mark. Right? Those of you who haven't been around, you got a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> Okay, but uh, the fact is, is that uh, four weeks, here we are in chapter 8, so redneck pastors making one chapter into six weeks, we're never going to make it to the end of Mark where we coincide with the beautiful crescendo of the Easter, it ain't going to happen. Sorry. Uh, yeah, anyway. But we're not going to leave this story. Matter of fact, I, I want to I put out a challenge of preparation, kind of this Lenten season. And we use these next four weeks to prepare our hearts and minds to grow in appreciation for the wisdom of Jesus and what He's done so that when we get to Good Friday, we know what it means that He must. And why he did what he did. In Isaiah 53 it says that it's his knowledge. The knowledge of the righteous one will make an account of others who are righteous. That's, that's us. When we fight against the wisdom of Jesus, we're fighting against the same wisdom that's made us righteous in God's eyes. Just as one, one trespass led to the condemnation, also one account of righteousness leads to the justification and life of all mankind. Little children, I'm writing to you these things so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. And with the righteousness, make a difference in the world. Have a fantastic afternoon. Come back for sub subsets part 9 through 16. <laughs> and we'll continue this story together. Call the questions. Talk